Hi, this is Lisa Johnson, Assistant Professor and Graduate Program Design Specialist with Ashford University's College of Education. And this is a very quick shareback reconference video of major takeaways from EDUCAUSE 2013. So the first thing is to give you a quick overview of the conference itself. It took place in Anaheim, California in mid-October 2013. There were about 7,000 people in attendance from 52 different countries. And the focus, as with all EDUCAUSE conferences, was higher education, particularly online, and information technology as that relates to both infrastructure and practice around the use of information technology. If you want to check out EDUCAUSE on Twitter, at EDUCAUSE is the screen name, and the hashtag EDU13 was what was used during the conference. So you can check that out with a search on Twitter to find some of the related tweets from the conference itself. If you go to EDUCAUSE, Educause.edu and look for the 2013 conference, you'll find a link to the PDF program, which will give you a full overview of all the buffet of things that were available. There were a lot of sessions to choose from, and this presentation will briefly give you some highlights that I took away from a few of the sessions I attended. The first one being a leading a culture of innovation, which was done by Sir Ken Robinson, who's fairly famous for his views on education. And he spent some time talking about the globalization of education, as well as population increases, and how we can craft our trade, so to speak, to meet the anticipated needs and innovations in education. Ultimately, he asked the question, how do we develop education systems and graduates who are adept at anticipating the impact of their contributions in innovation and creation? The reality is there's never any right answer. Things that are created, both technologically as well as strategy-wise, sometimes get applied, as we know, in ways that were never imagined by the original inventor or innovator. Some examples he gave include the television, the phonograph, and mobile application development. As far as the television, his major points were that initially a curiosity as something to expand media contributions to society became sort of the figure point and socialization point for all people in their families as well as communities at large. Television, as we know, is today global and also mobile. And so television has grown way beyond its original inception in terms of a useful medium for communication. Another example that was given is the phonograph. Now, the phonograph, apparently, by Edison, was initially invented to record voice conversations on telephones. And at the time, Sir Ken noted, there was no real reason to record voice conversations because very likely you could simply repeat yourself. There, there was the fir first idea, essentially, was to have a form of voicemail. Well, voicemail, as you know, didn't come about until many, many years after the phonograph. But the point is, the original use case for the phonograph was conceptualized as something that didn't occur for many, many decades later. And so when we're thinking about instructional designs as well as any strategies for teaching and learning with technologies, it's important to remember that what we conceive of today may be adapted for other uses later. And so visioning those uses is actually quite useful at the inception of a new strategy or technology. And with mobile application development, he essentially noted that with the Apple Store as well as the Android stores, the initial idea was for people to create applications that would be more useful for productivity but as we know today, there's applications ranging from everything from calendar management to, as he pointed out, playing the harmonica on your iPhone. And so the point is applications have taken a life of their own as people devise uses for mobile applications on these extremely useful mobile smartphone devices. Furthermore, uh, Sir Ken spoke about globalization and learning culture through technology. He talked about how institutions of education are giving way to a more even playing field of providers of learning opportunities. And this reminded me a lot of the, the early publication, The World is Flat, and the idea of that power structures, not only for educational providers, but for those consuming education opportunities, has been flattened tremendously. And he spoke uh, in some detail about the symbiosis of information and technology technology and the individualization and personalization we're seeing today, where everything from Google Glasses to the mobile smartphones are allowing people to personalize their technological experience as an interface with both other humans as well as information in general. And we're seeing a true symbiosis of this occur. Finally, he also spoke of population-driven revolutions, speaking largely of areas such as Africa and India and China as bringing to the fore more use cases and opportunities for learning opportunity and design. 
And he noted that for the first time in history, we're more able to accurately count the global population. And he gave some figures in terms of who had lived on, how many people have lived on the Earth throughout history and how many are here today. And those were all very interesting facts. But ultimately, what I heard from this part of his presentation was the, the emphasis on the difference between fluencies and literacies. And essentially what that brought to mind for me was that we teach people how to use technologies, we teach people how to learn and be literate in language and so forth, but very rarely do we as formal education providers get the opportunities, except for perhaps in graduate learning and graduate schools, to have fluencies that go beyond just basic literacies. And so the opportunities for institutions of education to develop those fluencies while the even playing field of providers of learning opportunities to provide literacies may be the demarcation line between what we do in the formal sense at universities and colleges and what happens in a more layman sense between the providers on everyone from the average blogger to someone on Amazon. Another session that I explored was exploring emerging and innovative learning models in higher education. It was a panel of presenters, Frederick Hurst, Brian Lukoff, Kirk Trickstead, and Kathleen Burns. And what they essentially focused on were goal setting by students as part of their educational process, which we've known for some time leads to a more meaningful approach to one's learning. And then also they explored flipped classroom approaches from a blended model, mostly speaking of campus needs in terms of infrastructure and technology. And they talked about support labs where the learners will come to these support labs for assistance. And the rule, which I thought was very interesting, was that students asking questions must frame their questions in terms of the work that they had already completed and activities. And he was speaking, um, the gentleman, specifically in terms of mathematics laboratories for support. But I think we could apply this same approach to webinars where we give learners the opportunity to visit with us as online faculty and also with student peer groups where the, the main agenda would be questions only. So I liked that idea that the, the meetings of the mind, so to speak, would be centered around bringing questions and not bringing frustrations for support. Okay, moving on. There was also a session on lessons and competency-based education program development. This was also a panel of presenters, and they were talking mostly about the definition of the unit of learning and the Carnegie uh, research there in, in terms of what it means to have seat time and equivalency and how that affects development of competency-based programs. Competency-based programs will and are taking off in terms of their importance. Our creditors are becoming more open to them. The federal government in the United States has started to embrace them. We're starting to recognize that it isn't a monolithic approach to learning that is going to fit for everyone, but rather redefining the roles of faculty, evaluators, coaches, and advisors, and the learner in support of student learning is so significant in the competency-based model. And also it talked a little bit about in this session, the panel, about issues of progression, preparation, and specialization in competency-based models. It's really too much to present here, but essentially this gave me a lot of ideas about how we might structure competency-based degrees for Ashford University and beyond. The next session that I saw was called Close Encounters of the Fourth Kind, Laying Bare the Questions. And the speaker was one of the leadership award winners from Educause, Bill Hogue. And he talked about close encounters of the fourth kind being those that shape and alter our perceptions. And he really just went through and with sort of a framework of people who have entered the field of education accidentally and sometimes on purpose, how they've influenced and transformed our industry. And some notable quotes from this particular session that I took away from Bill were, what am I serving today? Asking yourself that question every day, what am I serving? Could also be phrased, what reality am I creating? And I do think that the, the quality of our life, as is often said, is reflected in the quality of our thoughts. And so approaching each day with asking yourself, what am I serving, and having a servant attitude could certainly be a, a useful thing, I think. He also mentioned that culture eats strategy for breakfast and emphasized that in terms of the importance of recognizing the culture in which one is operating, whether that be a classroom environment, university environment, whatever. The point is you can have all the strategy you want for how you're going to accomplish your goals, but ultimately if you don't factor in the culture that you're working within, your strategies are likely to fall flat. And that's actually something that rang true and very deeply for me coming out of my anthropological background, that culture matters. Matters. And understanding the culture of where we're operating, whether it be as a student or as a faculty or wherever we, we contribute and serve in our industries, is to always recognize the culture in which we're operating.
And then finally, a really great quote I thought came from this session was, never mistake a clear vision for a short distance. And from that I took away that it's very easy to come up with just-in-time solutions often to issues that we're facing, whether it be in assignment completions as a student or whether it's designing some guidance for learners as a faculty or whatever we're doing. It's just important not to mistake the clarity of our solutions as, a, as something that only solves issues in the short term, so that planning for the long term is important, I think was the ultimate point of that quote. It's a pretty interesting session, actually, and it was really, really fun to attend. The next session that I attended that I found some interesting takeaways from was using transparent pedagogy in online teacher education. And since working with the College of Education at Ashford University is one of the things I do, this was very important to me to attend. And I really just loved this session because online teacher education can produce some specific challenges in terms of transparent pedagogy, which is essentially laying bare your methodologies and choices as a faculty and as an educator so that students can learn from those and apply apply them in their own practice, which is a form of cognitive apprenticeship, which you'll find, for those of you uninitiated to that particular area of study, in a lot of constructivist writings. So essentially the point was to elucidate our choices that we make as faculty for our students and be transparent in our pedagogical or andragogical approaches so that students can make great decisions as well, be more effective as educators by learning from our thinking processes. And this related very much to me in terms of the concept of transparent design approaches. In our courses, I wonder for students how useful it would be, especially in the College of Education, to have a sidebar note next to every activity noting why this particular activity was chosen over other possible choices. Because the reality is, in any instructional design, there are multiple choices that could be made to be effective for the design. And I wonder sometimes, if we were more transparent in our course design approaches, if that would be beneficial to our learners to understand, as maybe perhaps even faculty as well, to understand why specific decisions were made in the choices of strategy for those courses. So again, how does transparent pedagogy relate to transparent design approaches? I was left with that question as I, as I left the session. The next session that I attended that I took some takeaways from was Adaptive Learning, Effectively Integrating Technology into the Classroom. And this, too, was by a panel of presenters. And this particular panel were reporting on their preliminary results from grants that they've received from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to develop adaptive learning. And it talked a lot about of adaptive and personalized learning next phases in modern education. And one of the big takeaways from that that I took away from the session was that selective release uh, tools that gate content to release it to learners is really the, the beginning level of adaptive learning con and content for adaptivity. But where we're moving in today is the ability to use deep, deep, deep analytics um, in terms of learner interaction, faculty interaction, and performance on activities to design learning that is far more adaptive and personalized to the individual student. And I don't think we're quite there yet in terms of implementation. I don't think our learning management systems that are most popular today really have the ability to create high-intensity adaptive learning opportunities. But I do think that we're in the revolution right now, and we're seeing the possibilities in new ways, given these data-rich uh, areas that we have to pull from to personalize the learning for students. And finally, a session that I attended on social presence, which is a pretty much an old hat topic for me. Uh, the focus was by this panel of presenters on cognitive, social, and teaching presence, which I equate with reducing transactional presence, regardless of modality. And so whether you're talking about online or blended education, this session was just a really great reminder that even though it's been researched pretty much ad nauseum in online learning and most learning contexts, it's really important to continue to focus on how we can increase social presence, increase cognitive presence, and bring in teaching presence into the classroom to help reduce that all too significant element of transactional presence that occurs in the online environment. Okay, that's a quick overview under 15 minutes of my major takeaways from Educause 2013. I welcome feedback and comments or questions. Thank you so much for your opportunities to me to attend this. I appreciate it, and I thank you for your time and listening to this reconference shareback.